women that are swiping on men, matching with men, it's 4%. It used to be 10%. And I can't even blame them because I did run an experiment one time. I borrowed my cousin's picture and I tried to sign up for, I think it was Tinder. And I was just looking at the quality of men and I was showing my husband, I was like, what is this? This is awful. I think that social media has created a big issue in relationships when it comes to, I won't say stalking, but I will say being able to vet people for their online behavior. And so that creates a lot of distrust and insecurity in the woman. The same thing that's made social media attractive is the same thing that's ruined relationships. Welcome back to the Real Femme Sapien YouTube channel where I do cultural commentary. And today we have a very different video. I haven't done an interview in a long time, probably since I even became a mom. So I went to the depths of the internet for you guys again to find random women because that is my favorite thing to do. And the women that I found have been in the romance and influencing niche for a very long time. And so I wanted to talk to these women about what are some changes that they've observed in the space of influencing, in the space of dating, so that they could offer their insights to you guys. Plus, I just think it's so much fun and it's so hard to find normal level-headed women <laughs> to group together for a little chit chat and banter. So that is what I have done for you all. If you like this content, make sure you give a big thumbs up, subscribe down below and hit the notification bell. The first person that I want to introduce you to, which is kind of a big deal, okay? I don't want to spoil a surprise or anything, but she may have been in Forbes, Australia. Can we hear from Miss Gia? Hi. Hello. How are you? Thank you for having me. Yes. Thank you for coming. Can you introduce yourself to the people and tell them a little bit about what you do? My name is Gia McCool. I have uh, done quite a few things online, been online for some time, over a decade. And in that time, I've been able to do some fitness modeling along with relationship coaching and a little bit of dabbling into fitness and helping people just build better lives all overall. So I've just really enjoyed being in this year. I've met a lot of people here and I'm looking forward to this discussion with Allie. All righty. And the next woman that we have available to you guys is a woman who has solutions because she actually went out, took the road less traveled by and came out on the other side, both expecting and about to be married. So she has the answers to your questions. Can you introduce yourself to the people and tell them a little bit about what you do, Taylor? Sure. Well, Yes, I'm Taylor. I'm 45. I, uh, I've i been with my partner for five years, but we just got formally engaged and our wedding is coming up and we're expecting our first baby in three months or less. And professionally, I am a retired mental health counselor, marriage and family therapist turned coach. So now I work with mostly men, but also women. And we can talk about some of those changes over the years as I've uh, been able to work with more women lately, which is great. But yeah, I've just been online for a long time, started on Twitter, moved over to Instagram and trying to navigate all of the social media chaos. Uh, but it's kind of fun too. And I definitely get a a lot of my clients from Twitter and Instagram. So it's a blessing in disguise, despite all of the, the downfalls of online businesses. I think that there's a lot of positives to making connections with people like you ladies. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Yes. Thanks for coming. So you mean to tell me you were on Twitter in the way back times when it was super evil and toxic. What was that like? What did Twitter used to be? Uh, well, Twitter was different, definitely different. I think even in logistically, like the, the way that the platform was run, it was very different when Jack was around, <clears throat> but it was much more like male dominant in our neighborhood, you know, and the manosphere was definitely more prevalent. So I was one of the first women uh, around that time. And uh, Pat Stedman was one of the reasonable voices that countered the manosphere. And I really think that it was very important to have Pat Stedman be very vocal. And he's really good at, at what he does. Obviously, he's dealing with his own personal uh, issues right now being in prison. But <laughs> like, let's just speak about it professionally, right? Leave the personal stuff aside, whatever you think about that. But um, ultimately, Rolo Tomasi was definitely the head honcho on Twitter. And it was it was it was very difficult to kind of make your way as a woman. 
Now it seems much more like simple to just kind of get online and start talking about whatever you want to talk about, but you kind of have to pick a category, <laughs> like a box to, to start in. But um, I had to be very diplomatic and, you know, make my way, pay my dues before I had a voice on Twitter. But I think sometimes when, even if you're unknown, as long as you're speaking directly to someone's pain points, not like in a you know strategic way, but when you are speaking authentically and it really resonates with people, they begin to follow you. They begin to consume your content and take you seriously. And that's how you gain you know credibility online is just really speaking the truth. And I think people take to that. So it's uh, it's kind of a, a common thing that a lot of my clients say. It's like, found you on Twitter and I, I felt like you were talking to me. So I wanted to reach out and, and, and talk to you on a discussion every call. So that's kind of how it's been. Wow. That's awesome. So what year would you say you started influencing if you want to call it that? Uh, maybe 2016. I would, I kind of segued to online stuff because I was more focused on my brick and mortar business before. Ah, okay. Alrighty. So what about you, Gia? What's the first platform that you got started on? So I started on Instagram and Twitter in 2011. Oh, wow. So how's it changed so far? I would be curious first to hear your thoughts about how Instagram has changed because I think it's a completely different platform than how it started. I think I was probably in high school when Instagram got sold for that massive bounty. So what are your thoughts on that? So trends change as always, right? That ha that's kind of constant. Other than that, it's just become very, very saturated. So when I started, there was very few people that were putting out value and quality content and they were actually living the lifestyle. So the algorithm worked with that, right? So you had, you know, you, you didn't have to worry about fighting against the algorithm like you do now. What you have right now is you have, a saturated market full of people that have learned the game. It's a game now and they're not actually living the lifestyle. So you can fake the funk <laughs> to put it bluntly. And the algorithm is just kind of going to whoever's just throwing content out there as much as possible. So if you are willing to do, you know, content two, three times, four times a day, you're going to do much better than that, than those that can only put out something every four days. Yes. I so agree with that. Oh man. I went from trying out to figure out the Instagram algorithm and I was posting two to four times a day, just kind of seeing what sticks because I'm primarily good at YouTube, I would say. And I couldn't really tell you why. I just think it's fascinating, but I have had a tough time out of all the algorithms and I've been on multiple platforms. I never really quite get Instagram. Every time I'm like, did, did they change something? Is it new? Do I want to do a static post or what have you? But that's interesting what you were saying that people are not living the life. So what did you mean by that? What is the the influencer life? What should you do? What should you not do? What are people doing? What I mean by that is like, okay, so before Instagram started, I was already modeling. It's not like when Instagram came out, I started modeling. You know, I've been modeling since I was 13 years old. So it, you know, naturally when the, the platforms came out, you know, we wouldn't go see, we wouldn't do in person as much. Now we would just like shoot in studios and just upload our work up to Instagram, right? So what's happening is that now people are literally just living for the Instagram life. So they'll shoot, which doesn't even need to be, I mean, when I put my photos, I'm actually there. <laughs> I'm not faking the location. <laughs> I'm not, you know, making it up to who I know, you know, like everything I do is very, very authentic. So What's happening now is they can buy everything. They can buy their likes. They can buy their shoots. They can even buy their uh, presence and their status by paying certain individuals that have the numbers and have the status to take photos with them and to be in their, their sphere. So everything is just not, it's not what it seems. And people really are not able to, they're getting misguided because of that. Wow. I, I definitely agree because you said something that was pivotal right there where you're explaining how you were a model before you were on Instagram. And now you can become a model from Instagram. And I don't know why. And it makes me angry because I think real life models, not only is it, you know, kind of 
throwing it in the face of Marxism because not everybody's going to be born gorgeous. So you have that, you have that inherent human truth where we're not all going to be nines and tens, but you had to be disciplined. You had to watch what you ate. And then you also had to protect your mind in order to be a successful model. And now I feel like the industry, if it, I wouldn't know what the difference would be because I'm not a model, but I do think that it watered things down significantly. It's not just the modeling industry. It's the gun. It's, it's firearms. It's, Every single industry right now, they're choosing people based on the clicks and where the algorithm is going. So you could be a special operation. You should, you could know everything that you need to know about a firearm, but they're not, that company isn't going to come to you because you don't have a social media presence, but the person they're going to doesn't know how to handle a firearm. And they're the ones getting the brand deal. So (laughs) just, this is what we're dealing with right now. And it's, we see it in every single, right? You see in the relationship sphere as well. So, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> Do you have anything you want to add on there, Taylor? Uh, well, I think Gia is the expert on all things Instagram and marketing online. So I defer to her, but I definitely feel like the struggle with the algorithm. I don't know if I'm shadow banned or what, but I, I'll get engagement on something like, like just the re- last reel that I posted because I collaborated with someone else. The reel got like, 25,000 views or whatever, but I post something just, you know, germane to me on my own and it's like 200 likes or, or views or whatever, you know, so I don't know what it is, but you just keep trucking (laughs) and keep going and just putting the stuff out there and see, I really cater to who is already following me rather than trying, you know, really hard to get new follows. And I know I probably do a lot of things wrong, but uh, I don't know. I just, uh, I feel like it's, it's too stressful to worry about all that other stuff. I would say whatever you're doing, you're doing it well, you have a community and that's the goal. A lot of people don't realize it at first. I didn't know when my YouTube channel blew up immediately. I was like, what is going on? But then you kind of get to a place where you get to sit and you're like, what is my niche? What problem am I solving? Who am I serving? And once you figure that out, those people will stick by you. They are loyal. So I would say that you're definitely doing something right. I came across your content. So there you go. You yeah. got to be doing a good. <laughs> All right. So let me start with you, Taylor. How has the role of social media in relationships evolved since you first began your career as a relationship coach and podcaster? Well, I think that social media has created a big issue in relationships when it comes to, uh, I won't say stalking, but I will say being able to vet people for their online behavior. You know, like the biggest thing that stands out to me is when women obsess about who the man that they're interested in is following. And if he's got like a bunch of, um, you know, thirst trap girls on his follow list, like that obviously doesn't paint a very good picture of him. And so that creates a lot of distrust and insecurity in the woman. And so if you start to to actually have a relationship with this person, then it can create this false, um, like it's not, maybe they're not unfaithful, maybe they're not doing anything, but your insecurities grow and you might become very paranoid. And sometimes it could be true. There could be some kind of infidelity or inappropriate activity online because you can you can get away with a lot online, right? Like if you wanted to DM people or have these side conversations with people, it's very easy to do so. So, and then for women too, uh, it's they're pretty notorious for, you know, having like multiple conversations going. And when you have your own business, I think it's different, right? Like you do it for, for money, for your business, for your livelihood. But when you're just a, a, a regular person online, it can still give you that validation when you're getting messages or people are liking your pictures and making comments and complimenting you. And that can be addictive to a lot of women. So at the root of that, I think it's it's that insecurity and it feeds that cycle. So women and men both need to recognize what unhealthy validation is and how not to rely on that from social media because it can be very addictive and it can create um, a big wedge in a relationship of distrust and just not being able to establish healthy relationship boundaries, which I think is kind of the biggest problem is people are getting away with kind of this laissez-faire attitude in relationships because there's not enough stipulations or regulations that they can kind of just act like they're single when they're coupled and re-educating the general public on that can be difficult. So it's usually when 
people come to, you know, to, to talk to me specifically where they're trying to find those solutions that you were talking about. And I start to help clarify how they ask for their needs to be met and how to make sure they know um, how to just have a conversation about some of these difficult things and create those healthy relationship boundaries. That's the most important thing. So other than vetting, obviously, but once you are connected to someone, making sure that you're attending to all of those things and not just, you know, <laughs> leaving them up in the air and vague and ambiguous and then waiting for something bad to happen and then trying to fix it afterwards. It's really about prevention in healthy relationships and honoring that commitment that you made to someone. And that seems to be eroding, you know, in our culture. And so social media, I think, has made that worse. I definitely agree. Now, you know, everyone's been scrolling on Valentine's Day at one point or another. <laughs> and I think it's the worst time if you're a woman who's high in neuroticism and you have a comparative mind, like maybe don't scroll on Valentine's Day because you're gonna be judging your man no matter what for like the dumbest reasons ever. I, you know, I'm guilty sometimes. I'm not gonna lie, but I just try to laugh it off with my husband. Like, look at this. Where's my private jet? And we just chuckle <laughs> about it. <laughs> you're I right. So Comparison yeah. is a big one too. That's a mm -hmm. huge issue. And then I was going to say, I don't particularly have an issue with female commentators or women that are in the relationship niche who end up finding love later in life. And that's a very subjective term in itself later in life. It's just there's a different timeline for women than there is for men just based off of biology alone. My only issue has been that whenever I ask these women, OK, so you went and you did the thing. So how can we talk to younger women who are probably going to find themselves in similar predicaments, how can we assist them into being able to secure that relationship? Well, securing a relationship is not completely in our control. So I think that is one of the biggest things that I work on when with women is being able to work through that neuroticism, right? Of letting go of control and being able to surrender and focus on what yourself so that you're really just refining yourself and, and making sure that you're healthy, you can self-regulate because emotional dysregulation is probably the biggest issue and dealing with that, that neuroticism, that insecurity and being able to find purpose on your own, because obviously, you know, you want to be able to support the man's mission and purpose and be complimentary in that way. But you need to have a passion of your own as well. You need to have that light that is going to attract the man. And so if you're so worried about finding the guy, then it's going to come across as clingy and it's not going to be that attractive to the man. So you're going to push him away, but then also you're missing this really important piece. And that's sometimes what draws men to the wrong women, that they have all this passion and vulnerability, but they don't have any of the appropriate, you know, masculine elements of like, you know, being disciplined, having strong work, worth ethic and boundaries and integrity and all of that sort of stuff. So really finding a way to create that balance of integration as an individual woman first and finding something that can light up that radiance and that femininity inside of you first. And obviously being with the right man will just help you cultivate that more. But I think it's really just helping them see that you can't put the cart before the horse. I like what you said there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Gia, how has the role of social media and relationships evolved since you first began your career as a relationship host, coach and podcaster? So the best way that I can try to help people see where it's changed is that it's a double-edged sword. The same thing that's made social media attractive is the same thing that's ruined relationships. And I always try to relate to people in this way. Let's say before social media, you were looking for a trainer, a physical, you know, somebody for fitness or physical therapist, you would go to somebody in your local area, right? They would present you with a price. That was your choice. You'd take it, right? You valued that advice that you got. Now what's happened, and this goes across the board to every single industry, is you can go online and you can pull professionals from around the globe and now cheapen that value. So because you have 10 people deal with, hey, can I get this cheaper? Can I get this? Can I get that? Well, the same thing goes into dating. Relationships now have been cheapened. I think of it like an Amazon, right? You think that you have 10 different men to choose from or 10 different women to choose from. And you think they all just look better every single time you swipe. But what you're failing to realize is the qualities, the value in those individuals. 
walls, right? You can't see that. And so every single time you go through a bad experience or a negative experience, you tend to label all women a certain way or all men a certain way. And that's what we're seeing right now. And that's what social media has done to relationships. I used to do a lot of relationship content, but I realized at a certain point in being married and becoming a mom, there wasn't anything that I could really say. I barely relate to dating women because I've been in long-term relationships since I was 19. I don't know what it's like to have a bunch of men vying for your attention. I've never had a full inbox. I've never really even been that revealing on social media. I got a little bit teased by my friends when I was 15 because I would always dress business casual. They said they, they would tell me often that I dressed like a mom. So I just don't even know what it's like. I can't imagine being absolutely gorgeous and then having this opportunity before you. And then a lot of women, they do think that it's going to last forever. So what you're saying, I think is true. But I personally don't know anything about it. So when I see people freaking out online about, look at all the options that women have. Look at how attention-seeking they are. Look at how lame these guys are. I think that I just don't want to be in the shark tank. I would just try to find someone that I have similar values to. And, you know, I, I think as well, a lot of women are hung up on looks with men. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't be in a relationship with a man that you're attracted to. I think you definitely should, but to look to the man to be the beauty and not you, the woman, I think that that's really confused. Women. I feel like I like them. I like lumberjacks more. I don't want a soft, you know, soft handed modern, lumberjack. Modern women want it all. They don't just want looks. They want the big, tall, good looking guy who's in the gym, who has the money, who's made, who's letting them travel, who's letting them shop. They want it all. And the problem with that is that social media is feeding the expectations that they can have it all. So that is the reason why social media has really affected relationships. Ultimately, I have seen a huge change in just you know the girls that I'm around, the models that I'm around, you know, I'm exposed to it all day long. So I see it constantly. I mean, I deal with it. I have my DMs full all the time. So, and I'll speak to the the men uh, that I work with often. I find that if they're, you know, just they don't even have to be like 10 out of 10 kind of men, but even if they're above average, uh, they think that they will get <laughs> the 10 out of 10 woman, right? And they're so frustrated because she is hard to find, like a beautiful woman who has all of the elements that, like that dream woman that I talk about all the time, the ideal woman, is she's very hard to find. She is rare, just like the dream man can be as well. But they're easy to find because you can distinguish them from the rest of the people, right? Like, so you know them when you find them and they are out there. They're just not usually, you know, loud and easy to find. You have to actually do your due diligence and work on the inside and then put yourself in position to interact with these people, connect with these people, hopefully organically if you can do it. But it happens online, like with myself as well. But ultimately these men, they come up with these fantasy women and they have a hard time sometime, I wouldn't say settling, but they think that there's someone better out there, right? So we're talking about like that FOMO or um, what is that term called again when it's like you get like analysis paralysis or you you, you can't make up your mind because they have too many options. And trying to confront that bit of ego in them is hard because they may have these rose-colored glasses on thinking that they're going to get a certain sort of fantasy type of woman and recognizing that when you meet the right person, they're going to be a 10 out of 10 for you, but they may not be from the outside, this cookie cutter model looking woman, right? And I think that sometimes is really hard to break through because a lot of the men that I work with, they're 40 plus. So we're talking about a 40 plus man who, you know, is above average, but he's expecting like that 28 year old dream woman to just appear. And I think that's... Uh, that image has been created by social media, that there's all these women out there that they are owed, basically. And so just bringing them back down to earth. And it goes both ways for, for women as well. I'm just speaking to a lot of the men that I work with. I have to break through that false assumption that um, that's what you need to hold out for. Because you don't need to hold out for the, the package that they have in their mind. It's really like what Gia was saying. It's the character and the values and the person that they will fall in love with and become that amazing muse to them that will seem like it, that she'll be a 10 out of 10 for him at that point, but she might not look like 
who knows, Giselle Bunchen or something like you need to understand Giselle might divorce you, right? And take half your, your assets. So you really want to make sure that you vet for the right person who's just as invested in you and your future together as you are in them. I have my theory on Giselle. I think <laughs> that she went to Tom Brady and she said, I don't want you to get CTE, quit your job. And I think he said, no, this is my theory. I can't prove it, but wait, what is CTE? I'm slow. It's like a disease that these guys get because they keep getting hit in the head. And they lose their minds. So yes, that is my theory on Giselle. And I'm also surprised to hear that you're dealing with men that are in their 40s who have unreasonable expectations of women or the kind of women that they can get. However, I've seen a little bit of it online. I became the poster child for age gap relationships. And I don't know why. It doesn't make any sense to me. I didn't wake up one day and was like, oh, you know what I really need? A man that's twice my age. That thought never entered my mind. I just thought... I don't mean to irritate the men that are watching this, but I just thought like the vibes are right. You know, <laughs> it's like, he seems fun. Uh, we can vibe over Star Trek and music. I'm into that. But everything I saw online was like, there's a mass amount of women out there like me. And that's not true. That is the furthest thing from the truth because I knew when I was younger that I liked older men and not like significantly older, but I would say like when I was 17, I was attracted to men that were in their mid twenties. When I got closer to my early twenties, I was attracted to men in that were in their late twenties or early thirties. That's always been me, but I'm not most women. Most of my girlfriends, when I started noticing that 35 year old men were attractive, they were still very much focused on men in their early twenties. So I was surprised to hear that you had clients like that, Taylor, very informative to see how social media is warping people's minds. I mean, I'm all for, healthy, compatible age gap relationships, but not as like the expectation, right? Like to, I really don't think it's a good, there's a big difference between a 40 plus year old man, like seeking this 25 year old girl, like he's hovering around where young women hang out so that he can grab one. Like there's a big difference between that kind of predatory attitude, which I think a lot of the pushback that I get when I talk about age gaps, they're like envisioning that kind of guy versus someone who's just vetting for a healthy, compatible woman. And she happens to be in her mid to late twenties. Like that is totally different. And I see nothing wrong with that. But in the in this situation, right, I tried to just get these men to widen their scope, their range of what they're looking for. I'm like, well, maybe, you know, you need to just shift it a little bit. And maybe this is like more exceptional here, not like what you're focusing on, because your chances are going to go way down for a man who's above average and he's 40 plus. Like, let's just say he's 41, like 40 or 41. So he's just over 40. He looks younger. He's attractive. He's got everything going for him. Um, you should not rule out 37 year old women because that is your your best target market, right? Like it it might not be biologically the best case scenario for if you want a multiple children, but those are the women that are going to be very attracted to you and you're going to have more positive outcomes with. So don't rule them out. At least vet them and see, are they healthy? Are they fertile? I mean, there are things that you can you can do. And as obviously it takes time to vet for the fertility stuff and talk about those things. But you can definitely see, is she healthy? Has she taken care of herself? What are her family values? Is she relationship ready? Because a 37-year-old who's casually dating is not a viable option, but a 37-year-old woman who, for whatever reason, contextually remains single, but she's extremely healthy and really ready to settle down and get married, it could happen fast that you, if you click, that you could get married and start having kids before she's 40. So there's still options there for those men. So I just tell them, you know, let's not rule that demographic out and let's not focus so heavily on that 25 to 28 year age gap. I'm seeing a common theme in your responses. It seems like you're guiding people away from focusing on lack and trying to open their eyes to maybe a broader dating pool. That's what I've seen so far. Gia, what do you do to ground women to let them know, hey, that guy might not, you know, be around. Have you considered trying out these other options? So I always get down to what experiences they've been through and their upbringing. And then usually that helps me see where they're headed, you know, if they have the right mindset. Because it, like Taylor said, you have to first 
discuss with them what's in their expectations, what they, what's in their mind, what they see is ideal, what they feel is value and what they feel is qualities. Until you get down to where their perception is, you really can't help them see other people, right? Because it all starts from perception. And that's where, I'll go back down to social media again, it's really, really perception is people's reality. So I always start with what their upbringing was, what their you know, experiences were, whether it be in their own relationship or in their parents' relationship. And then from there, I can help them understand that maybe some of the things that they're thinking is not what they want. You know, like I'll talk to females who are dead set on, you know, marriage, 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 you know, he's got to marry me. But then when I show them their lifestyle, the lifestyle that they ultimately want long, long term, I try to help them understand that, that there's going to be sacrifices that are going to be needed to make made if they decide to get married and have children. You're not going to be able to continue that lifestyle. And they're usually very, very surprised about that, right? No, I can still travel. No, I can still, you know, have this type of lifestyle. And I have to try to bring them to show that there's sacrifices for everything that you want. There's a price to pay for everything you want. I've been thinking about that a lot lately because I noticed that a lot of women don't think that they can accomplish some goals if they're married. Your lifestyle is going to change, but I don't know why women have it in their minds. Oh, I have to establish a business before I get married. What if you got married to a man who is a decent provider, number one, or number two, just is very helpful and believes in you and believes in your dreams. What if you married that guy and then you opened a business? I don't know why women want to throw so everything away. Yeah. That's a great question. And every single time I dive into this subject, subject, usually they experience their mother going through a really hard divorce or a bad experience with their father. And it was due to them. Their mother had no choice. Their mother was kind of stuck in a way. And then that made the child grow up to saying, I'm never going to be like my mother. I'm going to make my own money. I'm going to have my own life. I'm not going to be dependent on a man. So that's why I can tell you, you know, from 2011 on, there's been a huge shift because before that you were only, whatever was in your local area, that's what you saw. That was your perception of your life. Now you're seeing all types of cultures and subcultures from around the world. And you're thinking, well, I can live this life, you know, well, I can do this because they're doing that, right? Comparison is a theft of joy. So yeah, a lot of women have a have a skewed perception and that's what leads them to thinking, well, I don't want to be like my mom. I don't want to have this but in the background. I want to I want to be able to have my own things. It's all about control. It's a need for control. Yes, women love control and we'll never get it either. What were you going to say, Taylor? It just reminds me of the uh the marry a man who loves you more. That whole phenomenon is the same thing in in a different context because they just want to have that upper hand where they don't feel like they're vulnerable or dependent. Um, because if, if the man, you know, if they're gaga over the guy and the guy is kind of independent and he's got his own thing going on, like a lot of times women have either relayed their own experience or horror stories about uh, being betrayed or abandoned. And so that it sticks in your mind that you need to have that control, that false sense of security where you don't feel like you, you know, you're reliant on that, that person um, in your marriage. And I think it's, it's doing us a, like a misjustice because um, yeah, women are basically settling and uh, forcing themselves to like pick men that don't, don't really, they don't connect with, you know, because you need to have that vulnerability in order to really establish a, a secure relationship. Um, I was talking about vulnerability today and I think that's like one of those evergreen topics that people don't get right. Like they think vulnerability means you're helpless and not recognizing that it is just, it, it's a necessity. It's an essential element of connection and you can't have relationships without vulnerability. So anytime someone presents or seems to argue like some reason, some excuse to keep them from being vulnerable in a relationship, I'm like, you're just setting yourself up for disaster. That's self-sabotage. It's not going to work if you're not vulnerable on some level, just a, vet the person diligently and make sure that you're being vulnerable with the right person and then be vulnerable in the right way. Like make sure that you're also taking care of yourself because if you can't stand on your own two feet and handle whatever the consequences are, then obviously you're putting yourself in a position where 
it might be a bigger risk than you want to than you want to make. So yeah, there's a way to do it, but ultimately, I think people have that idea that you're not supposed to be vulnerable in a relationship, and I think that's absurd. <laughs> what do you girls think? I think like you know, like you say, vetting. I use the word foundational because you know it's the same same aspect. It's like you have to start the relationship on the right foundation in order for it to be successful long term. So if you already walk into a relationship with the perception that this is the way it's going to go and it's very transactional in nature, then you have to expect that it's it's going to fail long term. Any relationship that's long term has to have a foundation of a spirit. And I say spiritual guidance because I'm not I don't get into organized religions, but if you don't have that spiritual guidance and you don't, it's not bigger than yourself, you're always going to take the selfish route. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. And it's also very avoidant. You know, we talk about attachment a lot online, but it's true. It's like, those are avoidant tendencies, right? The self-protection versus connection. And recognizing like when you're doing that, you're walling up and you're, you're, you still got stuff to work through if that's the case, you know? And so it's not just men. We talk stereotypically about the avoidant man, but women can be avoidant in a lot of ways too. And they don't even realize it. I agree on so many things, but I'm trying not to, <laughs> I'm trying not to just feel like, oh, I think this awesome thing and then this awesome thing, but you guys are just, oh, this conversation is great. Okay. Um, let me move on to the next. So adorable. Question. <laughs> Thanks. You know, I want to um, know what you think. Come on, tell us. Well, some of it's like, you know, for podcasts and then some of it is not per se, but, um, okay. I guess I'm more of a gambler. You're more of a vetter where from my perspective with dating, because I didn't have any guidance. I, I wouldn't think upon reflection. I think that I had to figure it out myself. I don't even think my mom had a conversation with me about what to look for in a man no disrespect mom if you're watching this i love you i think you're so cool so for me i just went out and i dated and i was like i'm going to bet on you and if this blows up in my face in nine months that's okay i got used to rejection that was another thing that i think was helpful and one story about how i got used to rejection was there was this guy that I thought was so cute in high school at prom and i danced with him and then the next day at school he said in front of everyone that i couldn't dance and i was like no <laughs> but ever since then i didn't really struggle that hard when it came to male rejection i was like well you know i'm gonna get hurt along the way but i'm not gonna find that guy if i don't try so that has been mostly my perspective and i would say that it's been very brutal learning definitely do what taylor says do the vetting thing you don't have to be a gambler like me i'm just uh, that's just how but I also, Ali, you have a very strong sense of self, right? Like your ego is healthy, you're outcome independent, which is a bit of a masculine thing, but that's not a bad thing. Like that's mm -hmm. part of the good masculine side, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are have a hard time with rejection, you know? So being able to confront that is very good. So whether you call it gambling, I call it just true, genuine confidence having like a healthy self-esteem. So I think you should need, you should do both vet and do that. Take that risk. Yes. Agree. You run toward fear now because you got used to, you're like, Oh, what, what do I have to lose? You know, am I going to hear somebody tell me? No, I might as well run toward it. That's basically your attitude, which is good. Well, I, I found when I started doing relationship podcasting, one of the observations that I made because uh, a lot of these guys online, they will talk about how awesome it is to be with a religious virginal woman. But I got to know these women and I met these women and I would say they struggle a lot with dating. And it's just because they're not given social skills or social clues on how to approach these men. So that was uh, one thing that I noted where women who haven't been taught how to be flirtatious at all or to just be pleasant and to just say hello they're shooting themselves in the foot they won't even say hello or introduce themselves to a guy and my perspective is what if your husband is one hello away i would do that what if your husband is one 450 dollars romantic course to teach you a little bit about modern dating what if that's all it is that's in in your way you don't know until you try and that's mm -hmm. always been my perspective so plug to you guys. You guys offer some relationship products. Gia, what do you offer people? So I have a few eBooks uh, with ghosting, with red flags, green flags, modern dating. And then I have a group coaching session. And then I have a one-on-one -on -one group, uh, group 
no, sorry, group and then one-on-one. And then Taylor, you do a lot too with the relationship side of things. So what do you offer people? And then how are those things going to shift a little bit as you embrace motherhood? Mm. Well, I'm really encouraging people to sign up for my IG subscription because it's only $5 a month. And I used to have a hard time trying to figure out how to connect just not like my clients, but people online. And so I'm using my IG subscription as like a matchmaking forum as well. So once you're in the IG subscription, I have a men's group, a women's group and a co-ed group, which I call vetting school. And so that's where people really apply and we process the vetting concepts. And you also get an opportunity to connect with the other people in the subscription in a more intimate way. I offer a monthly two plus hour workshop, which I have a presentation of the vetting topics, like how to be relationship ready and what it takes to have a healthy, secure lifelong relationship marriage. And then I give people a chance to share their personal experiences. And it's just good to have each person like connect so they can be face to face on video like this and start to get to know each other because it's always hard to get to know strangers just via text. But I have everybody introduce themselves when they join and just sort of acclimate to the community that I'm building. There's about 55 people right now. So it's still small and I can really have my my hands in it where I'm, you know, Every time somebody new joins, I'm really pressing them to introduce themselves. But as it grows, obviously, if I get hundreds of people, it'll be harder for me to do that myself with each person. But the veterans will have been there for a while because even these subscribers, probably about 30 of them have been there for over a year. So we're starting to get like these veteran um, subscribers and veteran people in the community that know the vetting system and help with the other new people get acclimated, which is really nice. So whether you you want to meet like a woman as a woman, you want to have more female friends or a man, you want more male friends, or you're looking for, you're single and you're looking for that special someone, you have those options in the IG subscription for a ridiculously low amount of money and you get a lot of value out of it. So I am pushing that because I think that is something that will help me as well, support me becoming a mom and focusing on my baby as he uh You know, I'll have to figure some of that out as I go, but I am looking forward to redirecting my business and I do one-to-one as well. So I have raised my prices, which has been a long time coming, but now I'm going to be focusing on really tailoring it, (laughs) pun intended, uh, to like fewer clients that are much more invested. So you have to really take the initiative and be willing to do the work uh, so that sometimes when you... You can't, your prices are lower and you kind of take any, everybody on that seeks you out. They're low quality clients. And so you end up doing all this work and having to chase them down because they're not fulfilling their end of it. And so it makes it a lot harder and more stressful. So the higher quality of the client, so I'm vetting my clients more stringently and accepting fewer clients allows me also to have more freedom in my personal life. So that's, those are really my two things that I'm focusing on most. And also eBooks, like Gio was saying, I'm going to be publishing like 50 eBooks um, between like once the baby comes, because I have like this archive of newsletter emails that I've been sending out for several years, and I'm going to be publishing them in topical categories. So the the information is already there. I'm just going to be publishing them as eBooks. So if you want to learn about integration or, you know, connection and chemistry and compatibility, there there's an eBook for that at like low ticket um, level. So like $7 for like a 10,000 word ebook. And that, I think that'll be really helpful too. So eventually I'll do a course, but I'm not there yet. You have a lot of big plans going on there. Good for you preparing the right way. I would say any woman who does social media in general, if you're becoming a mom, just go into consulting. I don't know why a lot of women don't see that pivot, but that's what you'll have the most time for, I think. And if you want a real pro tip, your most boss babe moment is going to be from months three to months six, because once they start crawling, it's game over. But then the first three months, they're just eating a lot, nursing a lot. So you're kind of consumed, but that, that three to six month mark, like make the most of it. You'll you'll see what I'm talking about. (laughs) Yes. And and actually I do a lot of remote coaching, like via text. So Mm -hmm. now the way that I focus my coaching plans with clients is it's like, I'm on retainer with you. So if you buy a coaching package for three months, it's not based on face-to-face calls. It's based on the amount of time. So for those three months, I'm on retainer. So you can text me, you know, in the, in real time, whenever there's a crisis and then you're, you're, you, whatever, 
like let's say it's a three month package, you have like one hour call per month, but we want to be checking in week to week, day to day on Telegram so that I'm up to speed on what's going on. So that part you can kind of do a little bit easier um, with the baby. I mean, I'm still, you know, going to have my hands full, but at least I feel like I'm going to be more accessible that way than having to get on Zoom for a face-to-face call. I agree. That is my only beef is just getting on camera lately. <laughs> yeah. I wish I had a little character that would talk while <laughs> I talked. That exists. I have to find someone who does AI, that freelance yeah. graphic. <laughs> That's a good point there. Gia, I was going to ask you this because we always hear about how social media ruins relationship, but what's one positive thing you think has come out of social media in regard to interpersonal relationships that are romantic? It's afforded people to meet from around the world. So now instead of just being stuck, you know, nearby or local or, you know, not having anything at all, now you can meet somebody that you might hit off and they'd be eight hours away or nine hours away or even across the world, you know? So that, like I said in the beginning, the the great thing about social media can also be the double-edged sword. And I'm an example of that. So I attest I think that's really important, uh, a benefit of the social media. And that's why I teach that um, and why I have my book, Online Vetting. I really am not a fan of dating apps for various reasons, but encouraging people to use social media, you know, even if you're not really looking for a relationship, using social media the right way uh, means that you're going to be presenting yourself well, and you're going to be making high quality connections that are even just platonic or professional. So learning how to use social media in that way, not necessarily to feel like you're quote unquote networking, but in a way you're just, you're really cutting through all of the trash and learning how to figure out who is real and giving an energy and attention to the people that seem like, you know, you really actually connect. You're not forcing it because I think social media can make you feel like you're forcing connections sometimes. And, you know, with all of you, I think we've made genuine connections in the DMs and now offline. And so like Sarah and I, we've, we've met in person and we talk, you know, regularly uh, in general. And so that's, that's an example of, you know, she's a much bigger account than I am. And so is Gia, right? Like you ladies are like huge. So being able to connect with someone on a real level that you may be intimidated by can be difficult, but it's important to see people as humans and to be human so that you can, you can still be um, making these kind of real connections. And the people that I work with and men, especially, they have a hard time with that because if they like this girl who's lady, you know, she's a woman, but I like to say girl. So they like this person on, on social media, but they've got 200,000 followers. They have to figure out how to engage with her in a way that doesn't come across as creepy and where he can kind of stand out and make a real connection. And that can be hard to do. And I think that a lot of people don't know how to do that naturally, they actually have to learn how to do that. So giving them the instructional manual in my book has been really helpful for for people. And it's funny because I have one client right now. He's been a client for a while, but he only just recently created an Instagram account. Finally, I've been like talking him into it for a long time. And he read my book. And so he's like, I've got your book open here and I've got Instagram open here. And I'm checking out like all these features and trying to figure out like how to apply what you said in the book. And he's asking me all these like really logistical questions. And I mean, he's particularly um, logical in that way. Like he's definitely uh, someone who's further along that side of the spectrum. But generally men are like that. And so recognizing that it may come really intuitively to women. But for men, they they need those instructions. Speak for yourself. I am socially awkward and I have been for a long time. (laughs) Oh, man. Does it get me in trouble online with other women? Definitely. (laughs) So I thought it was interesting what you were talking about uh, dating apps and that you actually do give people advice regarding that. I think a lot of Christians count out dating apps for some reason. It is the number one way that people meet. I think that Hinge can actually be a very productive dating app. I've helped a couple of women with Hinge, just telling them basic things. For example, try to be cheeky, go and get a professional photo shoot because you have half a second to make an impression. But I was recently listening to a podcast and it was an updated podcast with Rob Henderson and Jordan Peterson. And now the swipe rate for women 
women that are swiping on men, matching with men, it's 4%. It used to be 10%. And I can't even blame them because I did run an experiment one time. I borrowed my cousin's picture and I tried to sign up for, I think it was Tinder. I think I did that one. And I think maybe I did hinge and I was just looking at the quality of men and I was <laughs> showing my husband, I was like, what is this? This is awful. So I think it could be to a lot of people's benefit to just approach people in real life, but you know, try to be a catch in the first place. Nobody's going to say yes to a loser. I'm not trying to be mean, but <laughs> some people they'll hear this advice and they're like, yes, this is my moment. I'm going to say hi to every single woman I see on the street. And it's like, I don't know um, what kind of vibes you're giving off or like what kind of personality you have, or if you're even a healthy individual to begin with. So take that information with a grain of salt. But yes, I do think that social media and dating apps are neglected by Christians for some reason. Maybe I think it might be out of touch. So, uh, what are your thoughts on dating apps, Gia? Oh, so many thoughts. Where do I start? Um, one, you know, women are bombarded, right? So if they're on a dating app, pretty much the dating apps that are not dating apps, but they are the best are Instagram, right? So they're bombarded. They have 200 DMS a day, you know, how many, you know, messages coming in for men. So they start to see it more like, okay, I don't have time for this. I'm overwhelmed. A lot of times they're not even reading the messages. That's why men will complain about getting ghosted because, you know, they're not just talking to one guy. They're talking to five or six men at the same time. So you have that aspect. Um, you also have the issue that, you know, like I said before, before social media, you would meet somebody at a local bar, for instance, or a restaurant and you would hit it off and you would have a great conversation and you'd be attracted and you'd have that little spark and you didn't want to waste that opportunity. Right. So, you know, dating happened really fast, then the ring boom, right. That's how things happen. Now it's, Oh, maybe there's something better. You know, let me just keep waiting. Maybe there's something, another swipe, another date, you know, and they can do these kind of intervals where they can, you know, go through 10 guys, dating 10 guys at once, and then take a little break for six months, right? And then they'll start back on the horse and go after it again. And it's always, it's like a revolving horse. So what dating apps have done is it's cheapened human connection. It's made everybody just a disposable number. And like you said, Dating apps is not my preferable way of meeting people. But then again, people are working all the time. They have very, very little free time and they want to be in the comfort of their own home. So what they've done is they, they've gamified dating. Now it's like, oh, women are this way and this is how you get at them. So it's now it's a game and it's, it's a dopamine pleasure seeking, thrilling thing now. So yeah, here mm -hmm. we are. So true. <laughs> it, it poses a lot of issues too, because I think as a woman, you can't tell if you're attracted to a man, unless you meet him in real life, you can get an impression online, but I can't smell you online. And, you know, maybe I can hear your voice, but I can't hear it like on my neck and my ear, nothing like that. So, uh, it, I think it can present problems in that way, but I will say I've helped a few women go from no matches to, they did a little bit, a couple of tweaks. They had some cuter prompts. They were a little bit funnier than they normally were. They embraced that, you know, dressed more feminine and they got professional pictures, but then they started getting matches and then suddenly no guy was good enough for them. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> you started with none. <laughs> like you're so ungrateful. But anyway, um, that is you, why. <laughs> yeah. Like you think about, you know, before social media, your family or your friends would like do a little matchmaking for you. Hey, I, you know, I'm going out. Why don't you come out and meet this guy, you know, and they would kind of like vet for you, right? Like they already knew their background, their family, their friends. So you weren't just like walking in with a stalker. <laughs> so social media is like, now you're walking in with a stalker. And then what's worse than that is that men are getting used to thinking, Hey, if you clicked the heart, if you liked me, then you're down to hook up. It's like, it's this mentality of like, Oh, we're a match. We're going to go out automatically. We're going to hook up. And that's, it's just, it's dehumanizing people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So true. And I would piggyback on that too, because I agree that the dating apps were what gamified online dating, but now I think it's, it's transferred over to real life dating <clears throat> that it's gamified in the real world too. 
And that's basically what you're saying. But specifically, what comes to mind are these dating coaches that are like the matchmakers. I have worked with a lot of clients. A lot of my clients have hired some of these dating site, like what do you call them? Uh, match matchmakers or whatever. And they have these employees, right? Like this, I'm thinking of one in particular, but I'm trying not to say the name, right? But um, like there's a one head head lady, right? And then she's got these 12 matchmaking girls who are all single, who are all dating coaches. And basically what they do, this is my biased opinion, but this is what I see. I see these, these girls as coming under the wing of this business and they want the top men options. And so they become matchmakers basically to poach the clients, the best clients from their own clients. So let's say if you get what I'm saying, like there's the the business owner and then she hires a whole bunch of attractive dating coaches who are all single, who then manage all the clients, all the men that come in to hire them to match them with other women, but they actually try to steal their own clients from the women that they're supposed to be matching them with if they like them better. Wait a second. Hold on. I'm like, I'm not <laughs> getting it, but Gia's getting it because she's nodding a lot, emphatically nodding. Oh, okay. well, let me, let me try explain to- it. Please. So think of a real estate company, okay? A lot of the good deals do not get a sign put up for sale, right? They get sold in-house. Well, the same thing applies in a matchmaking company. They're finding suitors and they're matching them up with girls without even giving it a chance to the people that are paying for the service. Does that make sense? Yes. That is scandalous. Oh no. Oh, there's something wrong in here. Okay. Back to you, Taylor. (laughs) So I have these clients that have told me they reached out to these matchmakers and they've connected sometimes with the same girls, right? Like not the actual matchmaker girls, but let's say the matchmaker girls gave them names of women, single women to connect with. And my clients have told me stories about the same girls. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> like, I don't like the, the quality of the women that this matchmaker is putting out there because clearly those clients, the, the actual clients, they have a Rolodex of men, right? So you fly in one week, they take out, take, take out the girl. And then another guy flies in the next week and takes out that girl again. So she's just got that's why I said it's gamified, but ultimately those single matchmakers, dating coaches that are out there influencing, teaching people how to be great at dating, but aren't great at having their own relationship or teaching you how to find your own great relationship. They're actually snatching up some of these people because my clients have gone out with them. Well, in some some instances, it gets worse. So tell me, same women who are online teaching how to land a high value male are actually allowing the men that are high value to have mistresses on the side. Wow. So, and yet they here they are telling women, this is how you land a, a you know, a successful man, follow me, pay me 10 grand, and I'm going to teach mm-hmm. you how to get this guy. And in actuality, they have the guy, but the guy has how many different women that he wants right. as well. So it's, it's, this is, yeah, this is what we're it's dealing with. Awful. So that's why I don't like using the term matchmaker when I describe the things that I do, because that is not what I do. I do like old school grandma <laughs> arrangements, you know, like I know you really well and I know you really well. And I think you guys would just really hit it off. You know, I have your information and I vetted you. And so then after a long period of time, I will put them in touch. And it's one person that I put you in touch with, not like a whole list of people that you then do this whole dance with. No, I wait until I make sure I know who would be your best compatible match that I know. And so definitely very different. I actually, well, I have, you know, my DMs are always crazy. And they'll be like, hey, you know, do you know anybody in this town or that? And of course, I know so many different girls, right? I'm like, hey, you know, so I don't do, I'm not getting paid for any of this stuff. I'm just being nice and just saying, go, go for it. (laughs) But it's funny that you said that. It's so true. Yeah, I I don't, I didn't used to charge for it at all. But now what I'm doing is I do have like an offer so that if people want to fill out what I've created as my, I call it the ideal partner profile profile. 
the IPP, but it's not like a dating profile. It's more of a, like a self-assessment inventory that I process with clients to really kind of like an intake with the client where I really go deep into, you know, maybe their old patterns, potentially their blind spots, their strengths and weaknesses. And so that's what I do with them is to really get them relationship ready. And so that's the process that or it collects their information. So that's like my database of, of you know, people that I would consider matching. But I always say in the first call, um, when I'm, when they're asking about it, I'm like, I am not promising you like a, a connection. Like I'm going to work with you to get relationship ready. And if I know someone that's going to be compatible with you, I will put you in touch. But yeah, like some people just want that quick fix, you know, they want that easy band-aid version where they feel, because I think this is actually a good point, I think that a lot of people have a problem with, is that they feel like the more they date, the more they're doing something to get closer to a relationship, whereas a lot of that work is internal. And if you skip over that and just go on date after date after date because they see dating as a numbers game or finding Mr. and Mrs. Right as a numbers game, then you're not doing enough if you're not going out on dates, right? So I think changing that mentality is really hard. And social media is, has played into that. Like you always have to be out there and showing face and feeling like you're spinning your wheels in order to feel like you're doing something constructive. And there's a, there's a revolving door too, you know, like I'll talk to many successful men who let's say that everything is perfect. The girl's perfect. You know, she's beautiful. You know, he would marry her, but then she starts nagging about this because she, you know, a lot of, like we said, women have these expectations and they, they want a very successful man who makes seven figures, but they, they think that, he's also going to be the same guy who stays home with her and is always there for her whenever she needs him. And I have to tell him, no, there's sacrifices to be made. You can't have the guy who's always home, always there. You know, if you want the guy whose priority is his career, you know, you can't have the best of both worlds. So what's happening is these guys are like, I can't deal with this. It's too stressful. And they're breaking up with, you know, this great relationship because they can't deal with and the issues all the time and their, mm -hmm. their priority is their career so th there's so many things going on and then when this revolving door happens distractions I keep talking about this our world is so full of distractions right now that you could have a great relationship and a great connection but there's so many outside things that are just keeping you from connect you know being connected let's say you have somebody who lives in a different location than you and you'd have to travel to see him and he's working and you're working and you got this going on that going on before you know it a month passes by that's a, a huge loss of connection there you know mm -hmm. so there's always this revolving door yeah I, i've definitely had conversations with some uh, sorry ali if you want to go ahead no well my only thing was women that want men to dote on them and live with them and hang out with them 24 7 you want it, but until you live it, you'll never really know <laughs> if that's like something that you want. I'm telling you, I've met retirees and empty nesters. It is not all that it's cropped up <laughs> to be, ladies. But yes, go ahead, Taylor. Well, Dennis and I both work from home, right? So we're we've been together like 24 seven for five years, and I'm looking forward to to 50 years. But it's definitely something that I think you do need to regulate, right? Like you have to have your own stuff going on as well. And I always try to encourage him to, you know, hang out with his friends or do his classes. He let, he has like a combat class and his shooting and whatnot, or just doing manly stuff. But we do some of that stuff together too. But I think it is important to have for the woman to have a little bit more reign at in the domestic realm. Like I think women are just, they, they flourish when they have more time alone at home. And like the man goes out to work a bit, you know, it doesn't have to be every day, but I do kind of encourage them like, today would be a good day for you to go to work. Like maybe we can plan so that I can do my girly stuff or the cleaning and whatnot. Like maybe you can go somewhere cause he works remotely and uh, you know, set up shop somewhere on Mondays and Fridays. So I can kind of do my thing at home. And yeah, if, if when you're around each other so much, I think it can be hard to balance a bit and create that, like that sweet spot. So it, it, it is important to see like your wants sometimes and your needs can be in conflict. And a lot of people don't know the distinction until maybe the problems come and you're kind of trying to fix it. But in regards to career, I find with men, um, 
they want this relationship. Like they say, you know, I'm, this is the only thing I don't have going for me. And it's so important for me to find my future wife, but then they can't prioritize finding that wife because they just want her to plop in his lap, you know, like they just want like this mail order bride to appear. And so what I say to them is and kind of what was, Gia was saying is that in the opposite, like you do have to prioritize it before it happens. So I, I teach men to create the time and the space in their life for themselves away from work. So if I'm working with doctors or business people, C-suite people, I encourage them to start now carving out some time where they have more leisure, they, they start to explore more hobbies and do more socializing, like, you know, plug themselves into groups or classes, even though they feel like that's, that's kind of, you know, like extracurricular stuff that takes them away from work. I said, that is going to be where you build in your relationship time when you meet someone. And having that, doing that now is exactly what's going to help you connect with a woman. So even though you're not, you know, you don't feel like that's, uh, you know, important things to do, it is if you want to find a woman who you're compatible with and if you want to kind of create the space for that relationship to come. Right. Relationships are created. They're not found. So I try to help, you know, I'll, I'll get a lot of people, well, why can't we just find somebody who thinks like you? You know, I'll get that comment a lot. And I'll try to say, I didn't always think like this. You know, this was developed over time, being with a strong man and us working on our weaknesses and building up our strengths. So I think there's just this misconception that, you know, they want this ready-made woman or ready-made man. And there is no such thing. It's, it's created within the relationship. Agree. I was going to ask you next, Gia. My question is, how do you think social media has influenced long distance relationships? I'm of the opinion, you know, I guess as a millennial who is born into the social medias, you know, long distance relationships as a teenager were a thing, although very creepy and probably actually very predatory, to be honest, like upon reflection, given access to the inf- to the internet unsupervised, I'm like, oh, what a nightmare. But You know, I don't think long distance relationships are real. And I've also been in the military and I've seen people do some things when they're separated. Distance does not make the heart grow fonder sometimes. But how do you think social media has influenced long distance relationships? Long distance relationships are very real. There is definitely a possibility to have a long distance relationship. You have to be willing to take out extra time. You know, you have to be willing to get on the get on the phone you know, not text, right? So that's another thing I was going to discuss. Stop texting, you know, get on the call. Like me and my husband, when we first met, we would stay on the phone for two, three hours, sometimes talking, you know, we didn't do the whole texting all the time. You know, I think that's really important is to be around that person. So it can happen long, long distance. You can do it. You're just going to have to put an extra effort and make that connection and the building over time. Oh, and I will say if, if, If over time, you know, there needs to be a discussion of, I think women need to hear from a man, okay, you know what, I'm working at so-and-so, but at this date, I plan on, you know, us moving in together or us, you know, coming closer together. There needs to be that discussion because I think a lot of times men just think, oh, well, this is working. We can just keep it like this. And then she doesn't hear it from him. So she thinks, well, I need to make a decision. Is this good for me? And a lot of times women will just ghost and disappear. And then the man's like, what happened? And I'm like, did you discuss with her what your plans were? Well, no, <laughs> it was fine. It was great. Well, maybe it wasn't fine. Maybe it wasn't great, right? Mm-hmm. So communication, huge. And what do you think, Taylor? Are long distance relationships real? They can be, but I do think they need to work towards you know being in proximity to each other. So um, a lot of the matches that I make are long distance. My my. The one that I is my favorite. I'm closest to this one couple that I matched. One was from South Africa and the other was from Canada during the pandemic. And they are now engaged and she lives in Canada with him. And so that took a lot of work, right? A lot of intentional 
effort at communicating. And she is right. Like you have, it's okay to text, but you have to augment that and focus on the phone calls. And yeah, you got to schedule them, especially if there's a time zone difference, but having the FaceTime or, or whatever face, you know, video calls or whatever, that's really good. And even in the beginning, you can establish, I know you said before that you can't really establish attraction online, but you can, you can uh, create chemistry, like intellectual chemistry uh, on the phone and being able to see the person in real light, obviously not like a whole bunch of filters or whatever, but just being able to talk to someone face to face can really help build that while you are long distance with the intention of meeting up in person and clarifying what you want and who's going to go what, you know, where, uh, when that's really important. So you have like a regular schedule of visits and especially with people that I work with, if I'm, you know, matching them, there's a part of, of the form where it says you would be willing to relocate. So having that willingness, you can vet for that early on in the, in the, in the process so that, you know, are they really fixed where they are? Because sometimes, you know, the man isn't fixed, even though he's successful, he's more independent and flexible. So he can kind of go where he wants. And sometimes if the woman is too rigid, because she, maybe she does have a career going or family or something, keeping her where she's at, it's important to know that early on as well. So you have to do a lot of that clarification in the beginning. Um, and then if it's like, it's not going to work or you feel like it, it takes too much effort. It's tedious. You're not looking forward to having conversations with the person. You're just feeling like obligatory. Then you know that's not a, a, the right connection to be pouring your energy and attention into. So it, it's, it should be reserved for that exceptional time when you really make that strong connection and both of you are on the same page at the same time because it's going to be so much work. And that's what happened with Dennis and I too because – we were in different countries when we connected online. We vetted online for nine months. And then we met in person in Miami. And then we traveled Southeast Asia. And then we ended up here. But that took a lot of a lot of faith and a lot of communication from me and, and logistically relocating from the Cayman Islands to Miami, putting my stuff in storage and waiting for the invitation to travel with him and then being able to kind of uproot myself to Arizona to be close to his family before we really knew what we were going to do, you know, a year from then. So sometimes it does take exactly what you talked about having before, Ali, is that strong sense of self where you feel confident you can handle taking those risks. You know, you know, you can get yourself out of a bad situation or you can cover expense if you need to travel. Um, you know, those kinds of things are important to, to be open open-minded and to really feel like you can, you, you don't need to control the outcome so much that you can play it out if all the right ingredients are there. So I, I it, it's definitely possible, but it's not always going to be the right, the right match for you to invest in a long distance relationship. Another issue with long distance relationships is when they do come together, it's always pleasure seeking. And they don't actually get a chance to see the person in the real, their real lifestyle. So they get very addicted to kind of like everything that's fun. It needs to be fun. And then as soon as there's like a sign of conflict, they ghost. So I think that that's something that I stress when I talk to people is that see their real lifestyle, get a chance to really be in the way that they live for real, not on a trip right to a fun place mm -hmm. that's true for everything though like you're you're dead on and that, that's true for all dating and i think a lot of people have that problem that they just want to do the fun stuff and be pleasure seeking and so really trying to get encourage people to do real life things together you get that the i would call them the bad high maintenance people being like that's low effort dates i'm like no that's not low effort dates that's like the quality stuff that you need to experience with someone in order to determine their character and, and how they really show up in life. So that's my there was a guy, I think he, he did a tweet. He said that he took his dates, his first dates on like a, like a four mile hike or something. And then he would like manufacture like where they would be out of water or they get lost just to see how she would react. <laughs> and I thought that was so funny. I'm like, wow. <laughs> oh <laughs> man. <laughs> I'm so glad that's not me. Well, I don't know if I'd freak out that bad. I mean, it really depends. I'm just more likely to drink out of a spring and then maybe see a doctor later. But in any case, I did want to take this moment to say 
Congratulations, Taylor. Pick me award of the year. You put your stuff in storage to go be with your man. <laughs> See, women would never. And that's what I'm talking about. Like, you know, life is not this cookie cutter Disney movie. And honestly, some people do struggle to have that long-term committed relationship. But my question has always been like, for people that have ended up, you know, coming to that conclusion later, how did you do it? So there we go. We got some actual legit tips and we know we know we got proof in two ways that it worked. So, <laughs> um, yes. Oh, see, there you go. You get to flex. Let me ask you guys this next question. And this is a, a pretty broad one. So you'd have to reflect on all the clients that you've served. Have you noticed any differences in dating style between Gen X and millennials? You can go tell her. Yes. Yeah. I, I was telling you before that I think my my clients are more in the thirties and forties than they are in the twenties. And the ones that are in the twen their twenties, which is Gen X, um, is it Gen X? I forget now. Gen, there's Gen, Alpha, <laughs> Gen Alpha, Gen X, and Gen Z. Okay. So th those people are usually very mature when they come to find me. And so I would say they are outliers. Um, I'm specifically thinking of that one that I ended up matching who moved from South Africa to Canada too, right? She was, I think, 24 when we started working together. Um, and she was also in, a, in my women's group. And there was a 20-year-old woman who's now a mom and she's with she's been with the same guy the whole time. So they were already very settled and very clear on what they wanted, um, wanting to be you know, married at a young age. So those kinds of women, um, I don't really work with men in that age group so much. I feel like it doesn't, it, they're not ready yet to focus so, so much on, on relationships, unless they're Christian, then they would go seek like a Christian counselor, supposedly. I, I mean, I would imagine, but I do work with Christians. They're just usually older. Um, I think the, the youngest male that I'm working with is 30 and now, but I've worked with like a 28 year old guy and they're still kind of, you know, <laughs> they're still figuring out their own independence. And so, the difference with them is really focusing on their, their, their purpose, their mission. If we're talking about a man, um, versus really settling down. And even though they want to connect with a healthy woman, cause a lot of these, even those men, they've connected with unhealthy women who maybe they have codependent relationships with, or maybe they, be, they became like head over heels and they had one itis with this girl. And then they created some, that created some insecurity in them that they had to work through. Uh, a lot of neuroses in those, those men that I've worked with that I've had to help them work through and really just becoming a healthy man, right? Who has like a direction in life because that's, what's going to attract a healthy woman who's ready to settle down. And for the women in that age group, I would say a lot of times it's been knowing what they want because there's a conflict when you're a young woman that you're in your prime. So, you know, you feel like you have your options open and you don't want to settle down prematurely. And so those women are very picky, which it's understandable, but they have a hard time sometimes knowing when their man is good enough, when the, when the man is good enough. So I think with those women, it's really determining for them how to not romanticize love so much because they may sort of have this fantasy of like, you know, being swept off their feet and having no doubt or no problems whatsoever and feeling like they kind of have this fantasy play out. And so bringing them down to earth a little bit and trying to figure out what that sweet spot is when they realize they are in their prime and they do have options, but they also don't want to just throw someone away because they're not perfect. And I would compare that to the older people <laughs> as the older people are a lot more up to speed on that, you know, like they feel like, uh, they don't need, except for those 40-year-old guys that I was talking about that may have their head in the clouds a little bit. Generally speaking, I would say the people who are older, it's kind of hard to pinpoint what their what their biggest problem is overall. But I think um, what I'm working with, with them on is really not focusing so much on the infatuation of love, because I think that's like an ageless issue that people will really hyper-focus on feeling too much chemistry and not relaying or relying enough on the other stuff, the values, the life goals, and trying to help them see that, you know, even if it doesn't sound romantic, 
that it turns out to be much better in the end because you have that solid foundation in a relationship as long as you have attraction and you have chemistry, but it doesn't have to be this mind blowing sort of intoxicating feeling. And you know, I think they both really struggle with that just in different ways. I agree. Too much passion will land you in jail. That's my perspective. <laughs> Everybody wants it until you have it, that genuine burning desire. Yeah, you just wait until you get 50 text messages at five o'clock in the morning. But Gia, what are some differences that you've noticed between Gen X daters and millennial daters? So one, they're coming from broken homes, single parents or no parents at all. Two, they haven't learned how to communicate. And three, they do not know how they they literally don't understand the meaning of love. To them, everything is transaction because it's what they've been taught, right? So if they're coming from a single mother, they have been taught, you know, one, everything is, oh, what, what can I get from, from you, right? It's very transactional. Oh, the man is just there to supply something and I'm the boss babe and I need to go make my own money and no one tells me what to do, right? So, and then you have the OnlyFans factor. A lot of these girls are on OnlyFans. A lot of these guys are learning how to have virtual girlfriend experiences, not real experiences with women. So in their minds, they have real relationships. And these women, you ask the, the woman, she's like, no, I don't know who this guy is. Like, he's just paying me to talk to him. So yeah, communication, the meaning of love and coming from toxic homes. That is the huge, big difference that I'm seeing right now. That's a black pill moment for sure. <laughs> but I think, I think you might be onto something. I never thought when I was in high school, which I graduated in 2013, I never thought that some of the girls that I would be in high school with would be 30 going to raves, thirst trapping <laughs> with only fans. And these girls, they had two parent households and I just don't under, I'm never going to understand, but all I can say is it's not, it's not cool. Like not everybody wants to see you naked on Instagram just because we knew you once when we took physics together. That has been a nightmare. In their, in their minds, they think that they're actually connecting on social media. Like they honestly think text messaging is a genuine connection, but it's more of a networking. It's not a mm -hmm. true form of genuine connection. So what mm -hmm. ends up happening is that they get into relationships and they think everything needs to be text. You know, they'll never pick up the phone. I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I'll get, get with you. Everything mm -hmm. is always like me, 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 me comes first. And when I have time, I'll call you. And this is just mm -hmm. not conducive to any genuine, true long-term uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. Agree. Happy Could I add something else? Sorry to the question. Uh, after I heard Gia, I was like, oh, I thought of something else. Um, mm -hmm. With the millennials, I think one of the problems that I see with not the people I work with, but the, the people that the people I work with are dating or, or sometimes try to date is that those millennial women are so desperate for a relationship that they bulldoze or try to bulldoze those men way before they've done any proper vetting or they're just so stuck in that mindset of scarcity or urgency, right? That they're focused more on the outcome of getting married, having kids, because time is running out, right? That ticking clock that they're forgetting to really evaluate the connection that they have with the person. And so with a lot of my male clients in that demographic that are actually looking at same age women, that's what they come across a lot. And sometimes that's why they go to younger women because they're just so sick of these older women trying to force them into relationships and acting crazy. So that is a huge problem. You don't wanna get to that point where you've put off all of this work uh, of you know becoming relationship ready and knowing what you want and what your values are and making a priority making it a priority to meet a man right like if you're not doing that from your 20s because you don't know how long it's going to take and then you end up 37 and desperate that plays out often and so it's really hard to feel secure and feel calm and feel empowered to have options and not settle when you're 37. I, I have a, a brand new client who's 37 and she is so sweet. And she found me, she's like, you're giving me hope that I can find a husband and I can have a baby, even though I'm so old. And that's what we're working on specifically is just making sure she doesn't turn out to be one of those women because it's hard to break out of that insecurity. And she's like, I'm always thinking like I'm this old hag and that nobody's going to love me. And so, you know, a lot of times that plays 
on a woman's on a woman's mind and it makes her do really bad destructive things when you're meeting men so that's definitely not a good look and we need to make sure that the ladies are trying to prevent that obviously there are certain things that you can't avoid and you can end up in that situation and i'm happy to give those late bloomers hope but there are things that that you can do beforehand before it gets to that point one is not over investing in career to the detriment of your personal life see that's what i'm saying if you're 35 and single you need to be talking to taylor she will set you up right probably like you're i think you're the only one so far i don't know i gotta do some more research i'm sure and the reason why i think this is so important is because there are going to be more women in that predicament you just look at the numbers you know that it's an issue and it doesn't mean that these women have to be damned to hell and they don't deserve to have you know love in their lifetime so thank you for for doing everything that you do. I truly appreciate it. Just because I want to see the world be a better place, but maybe I'm the corny one in this situation. But yeah, um, and, yeah. and if anyone is watching, I know you probably have more women viewers than men. What is your your demographic like? Oh no, no, I started off in the the red pill, and so okay. I will forever have a primarily male demographic. No matter how much pink text I put up, <laughs> no matter how many times I talk about woman things, I've had postpartum. Um, pregnant conversations on here, they are loyal. They will not budge. So no. <laughs> so I want to, I want to like disbelief a myth, right? Any woman online who tells you that her primary audience is female is straight out lying, <laughs> straight out lying. And I'll tell you why social media across the board, it has more male platform users. So naturally you're going to have more of a male demographic. Now, what will change it like in percentages is if, for instance, you started out, you know, very, very relatable to women and, and, you know, and you were, your profile was, you know, done a certain way that you were very relatable to women. But other than that, you're going to have primarily male, a male demographic. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm too blunt to ever have a primarily female demographic. I have tried to get softer. It is just not happening. I wanted to pivot to this new area because I haven't heard anybody talk about it when it comes to modern dating, relationships, or social media. How have privacy concerns and online safety become more prevalent in dating and relationships on social media? Ooh, okay. I think across the board, it doesn't matter who you are, what you're doing, you're going to have issues with impersonators, you're going to have issues with people, you know, getting a hold of your number, your private information, the, the larger you're following, the worse that becomes. And I think in a relationship, you know, when you're online dating, I actually personally have been on reality shows that I didn't even know that I was on. Right. So I was told through my audience, Hey, you're on a reality show. And I'm like, no, I was never on a reality show. And they're like, well, somebody brought up your name that was catfished by you like they thought it was you that they were talking to and it was somebody else using your pictures and your name and they apparently got you know sent money for plane tickets and all sorts of stuff and then they never actually showed up of course because they were being catfished so this happens frequently and i think it's very that's why i always tell people if you meet somebody online and you're talking to them like pass one or two times talking to them get them in person, see them in person. Don't do this whole long texting back and forth, you know, get in front of that person. Get them on a Zoom call and say, you need to have a fork <laughs> and a butter knife and a spork and you have to hold up all three items in front of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so that's dead. That's a crazy story, Gio. Oh my gosh. I have, so many, I have way worse stories. That's nothing. You should get this to tell you. <laughs> But even like catfishing, there's a spectrum, right? Like th there are a lot of people out there on social media that catfish the public and the public doesn't even know. Um, I can think of a few people who they present like modeling pictures from their 20s and they're like 50 years old and look like a hag. And this is what they're convincing people they appear like now. Um, sorry, I'm not, I know that sounded a little, <laughs> a little harsh, but I'm trying to paint yeah, the picture. Um, and I think that that's disingenuous, right? Like it's one thing to have like, you know, good pictures and filters and all that sort of stuff, but to take it that far that people think they're talking to like this stunning 20 year old and it's you. So it's not like a full blown catfish, like what Gio was saying, it's a totally different person, 
but they also, they will tend to focus on the texting, you know, they mm -hmm. don't ever want to really meet in person. They prolong the process of vetting online. Watch out for that. Uh, if it is a, like an actual, you know, <laughs> vetting situation or online dating situation, watch out for that. If they keep pushing off and deferring meeting in person, there's something wrong. And even one of my clients said she was in that situation and ended up on a date the guy she was talking to for months and he was disabled and never said anything. Oh no. I'm like, that, that's kind of a deal breaker. Like, yeah, okay. Like people are PC and they're non-judgmental, but that's something you need to disclose mm -hmm. over the course of several months of getting to know someone. So mm -hmm. people catfish to varying degrees is my point. And obviously there are also very disingenuous, you know, social media personalities out there that present to be something that they're not, but I won't get into that. <laughs> so it's definitely a, a topic that, that we need to realize that media is dangerous. Social media is dangerous and mm -hmm. they're, it's not regulated. So you need to do your due diligence and check people out. Mm -hmm. I would say like the, the number one catfishing trend that I've seen from men is the use of beanies. They're, they're wearing beanies to cover up their flaws. I've seen this time and time again across multiple male platforms. Y'all need to give the beanies up. Okay. Enough. But Gia, you had something on your mind. Oh no. I was just going to say that the, the deep, don't get me started on the deep fakes and the AIs and all of this, because the stuff that they do to me, I've talked in private to Taylor about it. You know, it just, it's appalling. It's, mm -hmm. it's horrible. Oh, yes. Um, I was thinking about that in terms of deep fakes and women and especially young girls, because that stuff can be very painful. I recently wrote about this on Substack a, a little bit, what it's like to be a millennial woman who came of age um, and to have sexuality commodified online, even against your consent, because anybody could take a picture of me and put it on a, on a face. And I had a a girlfriend when I was around 15, something like that did happen to her. And this was before AI. So this is just when somebody had to literally work a little bit harder to Photoshop uh, a head on a body. And uh, I think it just means that we're going to have to start talking to young women a lot sooner about the realities of some of these things, because there was a, a 14 year old girl. She made a choice to unalive herself because she was being confronted with that, with this deep fake um, corn that was going on. And, you know, how do you bring that up to your parents? I mean, it's mortifying. Right. And that was something that I saw happen a lot because when I was a teenager or a preteen, when I was a preteen, MySpace came out after that, when I was a teenager, Twitter came out, Tumblr came out. And so you had a bunch of these hormonal teenagers unsupervised with social media for the first time ever. And there were uh, some girls in my county in my school system who had their photos leaked online, like sometimes very publicly. You, you, that is a terrifying experience. You're, you're 14 to 16 years old and you're swiping on Tumblr and everyone knows that this guy put that naked picture of you up. Right. So I just think that it would behoove us to talk to young women sooner because we can't yeah. stop it, you know, and I, it's sad. I wish I would never have to have that conversation with my daughter mm -hmm. at like 12 or 13, but I have to, cause no one else is going to. I, I, when I was practicing, I actually did a whole sort of campaign on this cause I was a sexual trauma, uh, recovery specialist. And it was something that I went around to schools and I talked to them specifically about this topic because I had a group of people from the same school, like I forget, like they were, you know, young teenagers and pubescent students uh, having these pictures sent around. And that is an actual crime, you know, even in the Cayman Islands. And so, um, yeah, it was definitely something that was disturbing and we felt like we needed to address it as clinicians because it, it created depression in these young kids who were then suicidal. And it was very hard to break out of that social image of being, you know, a slut and, uh, very hard on families and just educating them as to a making sure that you, are not committing a crime online and making sure that you're not sending nudes to people because you can't control where it goes and recognizing that, you know, availing yourself to that in that way to, to someone before you're, you're really ready to have any kind of sexual activity is it's the same as sexual activity, sharing nudes. So making sure that people have better boundaries at a young age and knowing how to communicate them 
and to supervise them somewhat, you know, like there's some parents that I work with that don't want to supervise their children's access to phones, but you need to have some transparency with and teach them how to use technology. You can't just expect them to know how to do that off the bat. I completely agree. And then on the flip side now, like, let's say you are an e-thought, you don't even have to really fess up to any pictures getting leaked. You could just say, hey, that was AI. I didn't even make that one. So it's just getting wild out here. Gia, what are your closing thoughts on the commodification of sexuality, AI, early exposure? Uh, awareness, self-awareness. You know, we need more people who have situational awareness. And this goes, you know, across the board for everything. I really think that women kind of lack that, you know, in general, they need to be taught that. It's a skill that's that's taught. When I got with my husband, I had no situational awareness whatsoever. I made huge, huge mistakes. And um, he taught me, you know, I had to learn the hard way. I had to fall and get up. But I think me walking through the fire can help people now in turn get through that because I got through it, I moved on and here I am. So yeah, I mean, my, my coaching style is hard love all the way. I, I, I mean, I'm not going to be suited for everybody. I don't want to be for everybody. I just want to be for, you know, people who are going to resonate with that kind of hard love that I'm here to kind of bring self-awareness and then accountability and then lead by example. And that's really how I lead with everything. Okay. So final questions. We'll start with you, Gia. What kind of content can people expect from you moving forward and where can the people find you? Um, right now, I'm just very, very focused on my coaching and helping people. So everything I'm going to put out is from personal experience or from experiences that I'm dealing with now with clients just to really help them get better in every aspect of life. It doesn't even have to be in relationships. It can just be, you know, fitness, health, um, business, even their social media presence. You know, there's a lot of people in my group right now that I'm helping, you know, with their photography and their bios and just making everything aesthetically pleasing so they can meet and make better connections. And that's really what I'm focused on. So you're going to be, get ready to see more eBooks, more programs, more, more helpful content. All right. And then Taylor, what about you? What can we expect and where can we find you? Well, if anyone's really trying to get relationship ready or they're at least willing to look at how to get relationship ready versus just, you know, having that dream man or woman delivered to them at their doorstep, because that's what it takes to work with me is really being willing and accountable to look at yourself and refine yourself. It's not about saying, you know, I need to fix myself in order to be worthy of love, but the people that come to me who are thinking like there's nothing wrong with them whatsoever. They're doing everything right. And the world is just conspiring against them to keep them from their future wife or husband. Those are the people that I don't work well with. Although I do tend to break through with those people, it's just more stressful for me. So if they can come ready and willing to take a look at themselves to see like what they need to change, what they need to tweak, and really just, you know, smoothing out the edges so that we can make sure they're in position to find the best possible person for them and how to do that, like through the vetting process, like really interested in learning the vetting process. Because if you're dabbling all over the internet and in every possible thing that you can find, it's very hard to learn something. We've lost the art of being an apprentice to the topic, you know? And I think people need to focus and prioritize trying my system out first for like, let's say, you know, six months, a year even. And if it doesn't work, if you're not seeing benefits, then you can always, you know, leave it and try something else. But if you're, if you have your hands in too many things at, at the same time, nothing is going to work. That's a form of self-sabotage too. So reach out and get a free call and we can talk about it. But like I said, also Instagram is accessible. Subscribing there is another great way to start what I call micro group coaching as a stepping stone. And then if you want to escalate into one-on-one, -on -one, that's going to be a bigger investment, but that's how we would do it. All right. There you go, guys. That is all we have for you. You can find all of the ladies links in the description down below, including mine. In this season of my life, I am mostly focused on content optimization, monetization, and entrepreneurship because I was really lacking in that as a skill set. But it, the thought occurred to me the same way I looked up how to make content, I can look up how to be an entrepreneur. So that's what I've been doing. So if you're interested in stuff like that, you can go ahead and check me out. I like to help women set up their career paths so that maybe they might be able to work from home and they don't have to sacrifice those things if they're trying to get prepared for motherhood and lots of lovely things like that. Also, I made it a point 
to get normal women to talk to on this podcast. I didn't get anyone who is psychotic. These are genuine human beings. And it's tough. You guys don't know. For the viewers that are watching, it's very, very hard to get women together and then for them not to hate each other. If you don't believe me, you can watch the movie Mean Girls. It'll give you a lot of perspective. <laughs> But uh, that is all we have for you guys. Make sure you give this video a big thumbs up, subscribe down below, and hit the notification bell. Bye.